Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Storage OS webinar. Our topic today is database as a service with persistent storage. But just before we get going, a couple of housekeeping points to, uh, to, to, to call out for you all. Firstly, we'll be doing a Q&A session at the end, so please do use the Zoom tooling below um, and send any questions over. Uh, I'll be curating those and, 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 uh, and, and reading them out later. Um, and also know that we will be giving away uh, three £50 Amazon gift vouchers uh, at the end of this session. So uh, the, 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 the lucky winners there will be, will be drawn anonymously. So please do stick around until the end and, uh, and, uh, and, and good luck to you all. So uh, now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, my colleague and your presenter, Rom. Thank you everyone for joining. Uh, this webinar is uh, about database as a service or actually anything as a service with persistent storage, meaning that uh, a new stateful application or legacy uh, one, like a CMS base on, on uh, Drupal can leverage the cloud native experience to provide a self-service experience when it comes to deploying, scaling and, and maintaining uh, or, or even through failures. So my name is Romuald van der Poel, and uh, as uh, Paul was mentioning, you can address me with Ram. It will be easier for everyone. I joined, uh, I joined Storage OS as an organization about a month ago, and I'm working as a cloud solution architect. Um, my background is infrastructure and mainly storage. Storage opened the doors of uh, every team uh, with each organization I've been working uh, with, from networking to developers, to um, uh, virtualization. I learned a lot from them every day for the last 16 years. Um, this opportunity shaped my current and future interest uh, towards DevOps and, and cloud topics. Uh, obviously, do not hesitate to connect on Slack, LinkedIn, or Twitter. I'm a social creator by design. So in this webinar, we will highlight the benefits of cloud native patterns that can be used to create anything as a service, uh, including persistent workload through the power of storage OS. The content is uh, ideal for anyone who is new to Kubernetes. We are not expecting from the audience any prior uh, knowledge of Kubernetes, storage OS, or Postgres, or Drupal, or any CMS type of uh, workload. The agenda for this talk is divided in four episodes, uh, including an Q&A sessions. Uh, don't worry, it's a, it's a 30 minute talk, so not a full academic uh, lecture. So let's have a look at the old Republic. So before mentioning the cloud native world, let's dial back a notch and look at the current or legacy way of deploying applications. This diagram represents a, a CMS based Drupal that will connect with an external database like PostgreSQL. All the different boxes represents information that are necessary to deploy such an application in your environment, from networking, security, all the boxes there, operating system storage, and much more that are not represented here, actually. So we call all those uh, dependencies, and all of them needs to be understood and addressed correctly for a successful deployment. So if we consider the previous diagram, uh, with all the different dependencies, when the developers are when developers are ready to deploy their application, they will have to go through a release manager who will or orchestrate all the necessary actions to be taken uh, within the IT organization to make a successful deployment. Meaning the opening of tickets, but also uh, through those tickets, the understanding of the overall infrastructure. Uh, then you have to repeat this for every other environments. Maybe it's here just for test, but you will have to do it for acceptance and production. Um, and these might have some variation that will create inconsistencies uh, within the deployment pattern across environments. So New Republic, what does it mean? Well, so what is cloud native? Um, we all need uh, to have a common understanding about it. And lucky for us, the CNCF helped the industry by providing, a, providing us with a definition. So I don't like to, do, to read slides, but <laughs> I might do it once or twice during this talk. So let, let's have a look at it. 
Cloud native technologies empowers organization to build and run scalable application in modern dynamic environment, such as public, private, and hybrid clouds. So it's not about the where. Containers, service meshes, microservices, immutable infrastructure, and declarative APIs exemplify this approach. So we need a lot of abstraction layers. These techniques enable loosely coupled system that are resilient, manageable, and observable. Combined with robust automation, they allow engineers to make high impact changes through frequently and predictably with minimal toil. So meaning that uh, each time you want to do something, you can redeploy based on the desired state that you wish to have. If there's no changes on the desired state, no changes will be applied to the environment. But let's dig a bit more there. So definition is available there. Uh, animation, I didn't check that. Anyway, so let's have a look at the uh, previous, if we were to compare with the previous diagram representing the CMS uh, deployment. Here we can see that everything is scanned together. We have uh, the, the, the CMS and the, the database being together, and we're looking into some kind of the same dependencies. So we will still have to deal somehow with those dependencies, but they are called differently, and then can be addressed differently without knowing anything about the uh, underlying infrastructure. Think about it, agnostic, we need to be reputable. From uh, a deployment perspective, uh, when moving to Kubernetes, the actual deployment is totally different. Deploying an application is not about deploying infrastructure. The infrastructure is there with all the abstraction layers to, and, and we don't need to care about them. They are already configured and they will be addressed uh, by the deployment itself. So deploying on Kubernetes is just about deploying the application, nothing else. You don't need to care about any of the, of the other components. If we look into this uh, and you want to be really close to the uh, definition of cloud uh, native pattern, then we will need the following components. Uh, we'll need a Git repo where we will put uh, potentially some application code, not necessarily, we'll see it with our example, and the deployment manifests. And the reason why we want to use a Git, it's for uh, a versioning control. We can look at what is, is in there and we can make sure that if there's any change, we will be able to review that with a peer and we'll have an, an, an example around this. We want also to have, um, I would say a continuous deployment. Um, we'll touch base on this because I think it's really important, especially when we are looking into uh, onboarding new user of Kubernetes that wonders how to do things. Um, obviously we'll need a Kubernetes cluster, that's, that's for sure, but also we'll need persistent storage and that's where storage OS can give a lot there. Um, so if we think about it for two minutes, uh, Deploying application as we saw before requires a lot of dependencies to be controlled. And those dependencies are not always consistent across different platforms. So containers really solve that problem. It really allowed to create an um, easy deployable image that encapsulate all the dependencies for you. Um, the second thing which is really interesting is to have uh, an orchestrator, because if you want to scale your workload, uh, let's say you have a Black Friday, you have more user coming on the platform, you need to scale that workload to be able to uh, respond to those users and obviously making a, a, an increase of revenue stream and guarantee some reputations uh, for your company. So to do that, uh, an orchestrator like uh, uh, Kubernetes will, um, allow an automated uh, scaling and healing of, of those containers, but also will provide to the developers um, a self-service platform where they can deploy at ease without the need to interacting with a dozen, a dozen different teams or creating a, a big amount and vast amount of tickets. Uh, on top of that, uh, you have the healing capabilities that is quite interesting too. So, Kubernetes has been mainly designed for stateless application, meaning that you don't need to record any storage within the container. And as a matter of fact, 
the containers, the containers image are ephemeral in terms of storage. So if you record anything on the running container, at the moment you destroy the container or you, st uh, you, you try to redeploy it somewhere else, those changes will not be preserved. So you need to have the ability to record uh, the, 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 the change of state or some data that has been generated uh, somewhere else. By default, Kubernetes is not uh, providing any of those um, capabilities. It's Kubernetes is an orchestrator, it's not a storage solution. So we'll need to uh, look into a, a software defined cloud native storage because if you want to leverage all the power of Kubernetes, you wish to be the closest as you can and even be inside Kubernetes to be able to influence uh, the overall scheduler and make sure that uh, when something goes wrong or you want to scale, you scale along with Kubernetes and not as a reactive way. So that's where storage OS is coming into play because um, we have um, a true cloud native software defined storage solution for running your containerized application in production, running in the cloud on-prem and in hybrid multi-cloud environment. It's not about the where, it's just about running it. So if we have to think about storage OS in a nutshell, so it's, it's a, a native solution for Kubernetes, uh, meaning that we are leverage, leveraging everything regarding uh, Kubernetes itself. So it's a full self-service self storage, like Kubernetes allows you to self-service anything inside uh, the cluster or the environment or the platform. It's super performant um, because of the way uh, we are doing things uh, and the way we are implementing a control and a, a data plane we are ensuring very low latency and high performance for every workloads. We are also scalable, meaning that when you want to grow anything on your cluster from a node to the uh, uh, a workload uh, and between the size of your volumes or the replicas, we will be able to sustain those changes. It's highly available, meaning that we have the ability to do replication at many different uh, uh, levels. So, you could have a volume with uh, without replication, or you can have up to four or five replica, uh, replica, uh, replicas if you wish. We're also looking into being fully agnostic of the platform. So when I say platform, I'm, I mean Kubernetes uh, flavor. There are so many flavors of Kubernetes uh, in the wild, um, and, and we are just able to deploy on it because uh, we are looking into Kubernetes and not of the specific other platform. However, it doesn't mean that we don't integrate with those specifics. And that's uh, something that is really important because if you take a, a, a distribution like OpenShift, for example, there's so many things coming from Red Hat into that product. However, um, you need to be able to understand those things and we are totally integrated with it. We are also um, secure by design. So any um, data uh, is uh, encrypted on the fly. And if you want to have encryption at rest, it's also there. And we do it uh, on a volume basis with a specific key. So we are not having one key for the full, the full cluster, search cluster. We're looking at the key per volume. So it's really, really nice for multi-tenancy. So how we do things? That's gonna be the last slide after I will show you how it looks like. Um, so how we do things, if we have a couple of different nodes in a cluster, from uh, N1 to N5, we will basically uh, look into those nodes uh, if there's any storage available. And it could be just local storage, um, like if you were on bare metal, we'll look into uh, physical disk or NVMe drives. Uh, if you are on VMware, we can consume VMDK, uh, for example, virtual disk. If you're in the cloud, whatever you are coming with, we can consume it. If you have a, a bare metal deployment with a SAN array, uh, you know, in, in your environment and you want to leverage uh, your investment, just connect uh, those uh, lens to the, the different nodes and we'll consume it. At that point, what we do is that, and that's the middle uh, uh, layer there, we will aggregate all those disks together uh, and we'll start making a pool out of it. 
And that's where we can provision volumes uh, for our workloads. Um, at that stage, an application that needs to have access to a, a persistent volume can claim it in a dynamic way from its deployment uh, manifest. Uh, and, and you can have access here. We, we, we kind of uh, give you a one-to-one -one match between the container, the volume, and the node. But it could be anywhere else on the cluster. So the workload on node one can have access to a volume on node five, for example. So we are not really um, making any locking there. It's it's up to, to you and, and the, the, the specific you wish. Um, we are super lightweight, meaning that we're looking into deploying uh, on any cluster. And as I said, we are agnostic. So to do that, we need to look into what we have from a, ba a base Linux distribution, and we are not looking into deploying anything proprietary there uh, from a driver perspective. We are using what Linux mainstream kernel is giving us. So that's the reason why we can deploy anywhere. And as I mentioned, because of this, we are totally agnostic of uh, any platform we, where we can run. And as we are, we are deploying as a container, we are super lightweight as well very few uh, uh, requirements in terms of uh, um, compute. So if you have one vCPUs and uh, one gig of RAM, we could run. Obviously, we'll be happy with more, but we can do it. All right, so that's the moment where there's a show me moment. OK, let me switch my screen. Here we go. So. Um, as I was mentioning uh, uh, before, we're looking into sharing knowledge with people, uh, with an audience that doesn't necessarily have an experience about Kubernetes. So it's very important. Uh, oh, apparently, there's some issue with sharing. OK. Here we go. Is it better? Yeah, I think it's better. So I was, as I was uh, mentioning, we um, we're looking into sharing knowledge for from a different spectrum of no, uh, uh, knowledge in some audience. So here I'm just going to show uh, how it looks like to deploy uh, uh, um, uh, uh, workloads on uh, Kubernetes. At that stage, we have um, from a storage OS, uh, we, we need to look into, let me see if I can do this, yes. Um, we have a basic cluster here with a couple of nodes, uh, nothing too fancy here to show. Uh, and we created uh, a class, a storage class. So meaning this is uh, a definition of what you're expecting from your storage to give as a security, for example, for your workload. Here, the specific is that we wish to have one replica that will be um, uh, guaranteeing that our data is safe on the cluster. So one replica means that you have a primary volume being the one being accessed directly by the workload. And then you have a replica somewhere else uh, on one of the other nodes that will be uh, uh, in, um, uh, in a synchronous replication there available in case of failures. Um, that's simple, that's it, nothing more. Then um, there's one thing that needs to uh, be address in many organizations, it's the concept of uh, segmentation in terms of projects or uh, um, internal customers or multi-tenancy, for example. And that can be done through a namespace. A namespace, or in some other distribution called a project, will allow you to have that segmentation. And from that standpoint, everything in that project will be the can. Remember the diagram with Drupal and uh, the database? That's about it. That's where everything will be canned in. And it allows also to avoid another project to have access to the data or the workload from this one. It's guaranteeing a segmentation there. The second thing, this, the third thing that we need um, is what we call uh, a stateful set and a, a couple of different things like a service. So if we think about it, uh, when you deploy a CMS, for example, uh, like Drupal, you need to have an access from an HTTP standpoint. It comes with, um, uh, uh, let me do one thing here, here we go. Uh, it comes with uh, the need of accessing from the outside world 
what we deployed. So that's what we have here. It's called a service. We are defining that in the namespace that we created, we will have uh, a service that will access the port 80 and it's based on the port which is uh, used by the container to expose the data. Here, the stateful set uh, is a definition of what we expect from the application to uh, actually deploy and use as resources. In this case, what we have, uh, it's a couple of different things that we like to have. It's, for example, labels. The labels will provide a meaningful, meaningful information about what is the workload about. And then we'll have also a couple of different things. And I, I will not touch base on this part. It's a specific thing for Drupal, but I will look into this here. So uh, from um, a container's perspective, if we want to deploy Drupal, we'll look into a container image. This is where, what is defined here. We'll give it a name. I call it FoodMag app uh, FE for front end. We discussed about the port. It was referred uh, earlier as a service. And also we'll have a couple of mount points uh, for uh, keeping the data. So um, those mount po points are referring to a specific uh, uh, persistent volume. Uh, and the persistent volume is declared here. Uh, and what we say here basically is we want to have a volume that will be for our food Mac uh, application. We want the, the volume to be uh, using the storage class uh, storage OS replica one. That's the one I show you with the one replica. And we want to have it with 10 gig. Um, that's it. And here after that, we're going to say that we want to mount the volume in the different di uh, directories here for the application. Here's the database. So database it's exactly the same type of format uh, in regards of the de definition for deploying the database. It's a service. We have a service here. Uh, a bit of a different point here. We're looking into only uh, showing a port, internal port. And the reason why is because we don't want to expose the actual service to the outside world. Uh, it's totally different as the, the one for the front end. Front end, it's basically for uh, users to have access to. Here we're looking at the back end. It's only for the front end to have access to. And then we have the same thing. We have a stateful set here that allows to define everything we need to deploy the actual uh, database. So uh, we have a, a name, obviously. Uh, and then we have uh, an image, Postgres, a uh, container image. We have a couple of things like the port we just discussed about. And then uh, we have some environment uh, uh, variables here. And I must say, just for the sake of the, the demonstration here, we're not looking into uh, uh, deep in understanding of what it is. And if you want to do that in production, you will not put that there. You will define that as a secret in Kubernetes and call it from there. Um, and then we have the volume mount again. It, this is exactly the same thing as we had before. So basically, we're looking into making this available uh, for uh, our container to write data in and be, make sure it's persistent. Because imagine if you deploy a database and you start using it, and then if you have any incident, the actual uh, database would, uh, container uh, database would crash and needs to restart. You would just restart with an empty database. Uh, there would be a nightmare for everyone. And we don't want that. So basically, this is all that, that we need. If we want to deploy the application here, we will be able to deploy it on Kubernetes. Um, I don't know if you can kind of grasp what we have here, here but all the different dependencies that you're thinking of, if, if you were to deploy a, a VM, to deploy uh, a Drupal and, and, and the, the Postgres database, they will require so many automation to arrive at that level of abstraction using Puppet, Ansible, Ansible Tower, um, v uh, Realize, uh, you know, all those different products that try to do that for many years. Here we can do it with about 150, 200 lines of uh, description. You are describing what you expect for the platform to deploy and make you available. So let's do it. So 
If we were to deploy this, we could do it uh, via the command line and do something like, uh, I want to deploy um, my files that are available here. And so you would say, okay, I'm gonna apply those files on the Kubernetes cluster and it will deploy my environment. Well, this is good enough if you want to try this in a, a demo environment or if you are a developer and you have a developer cluster, you can try this before publishing this uh, to be deployed on your production environment or acceptance. So let me uh, show you something here a bit more interesting. Um, and I want to highlight one thing also regarding the 150, 200 lines of uh, definition regarding uh, Drupal. This is the actual documentation that you have to go through if you want to deploy this. And you have uh, all the chapters here are looking at the, into all the different dependencies that you need to go through. Sometimes it's not much, but sometimes it's really uh, a lot. Uh, like thinking about on which type of Linux distribution you want to deploy, because the packaging system might be different. The libraries might be different also. But anyway, that was just a, as a sidetrack. So here I have um, on digi digital ocean, I have a uh, basically uh, a, a tiny cluster. It's a Kubernetes cluster uh, running 120, I think version 120. Yes, 120. Uh, a couple of nodes there, they were the ones that uh, show up into the console. And uh, that's it, nothing more, nothing, you know, nothing fancy here. Also from a, a standpoint, because I wanted to make it real, have uh, um, uh, a domain name that we will be using that also. Here I have a GitHub repo with actually all the files in. So if you want to have a look, I will share this later, but it's quite easy. It's on my uh, uh, GitHub uh, repository here. So you, you can find it quite easily. And this is where you have all the definition about it. And if you want to deploy this in a very interesting way that are, I would say, um, uh, ready for production, uh, or uh, at least from a, a release management perspective, this is the, uh, I would say, starting point. And it could be GitLab in your environment, it could be any solution, uh, uh, a Git solution there. And I want to um, kind of show up here, this little thing here, uh, this badge. Uh, you will see, I will come back to this and show you how it, it interacts. So, okay. So here uh, we have that uh, main version and I'm gonna go into uh, Argo CD, Argo CD. And I'm sorry for that. I'm just gonna uh, make a bit of a, a um, commercial uh, publicity for uh, um, a nice project. I really love that project. It's basically a tool that allows you to um, grasp what you're doing in terms of deployment and see in a very nice and easy way what you're doing and keep consistency. So remember the pattern is about being able to be consistent and achieve a desired state. We'll show this now. Um, I'm doing a couple of different things because I'm sometimes I'm a bit lazy, so I want to auto create stuff. Um, I will take the link to my uh, Git here and put it uh, in the repository URL. I don't want the head, although it's the same as main almost usually. And I, I have a path here, it's the CD. Basically, the CD is where continuous deployment, it's where I have all the definition here to make my application deployed. So at that stage, normally I just have to take uh, targets. And from a target perspective, it's the internal cluster. So if you were to have multiple cluster here, you can imagine to have a test cluster, a production cluster, and you could deploy on the one. And when you're okay with that, you can deploy on the other one. So it's an easy way to do things. Think about um, all the automation that you should do and you don't have to do anymore. Okay, so I will create my project. At this stage, what happened is that uh, Argo CD will pull out the definition of uh, the deployment. And I don't know if you, grasp here, but we did not look into anything about packaging. We did not uh, download any container image. We don't, uh, didn't download anything really for uh, that workload to exist. So at that stage, you have that nice UI approach to show you a couple of different things. So first of all, it shows you it's out of sync because it's not deployed. Second, uh, it shows you uh, here, um, 
a version, which is basically the version related to my uh, GitHub. So it's really easy to follow up where we are. Also, you can notice now that the batch change, it says it's missing in that out of sync, it means that we move from it doesn't exist to we know it's there, it's, it's available on my Argo CD, but it's not yet uh, deployed and it's out of sync. Okay, so let's sync this. At that stage, what we have, it's a beauty. I, I really love my job for this. Um, we created, based on three files, uh, a full environment that allows to deploy an application, okay? So at that stage, what we have here is everything related to the application to make it work. And what is really important for us today is to discuss about storage. So if we want to look at the storage, uh, for example, we can see that uh, at some point we were looking into deploying our uh, uh, storage and it was so fast from an API perspective because we were looking at the, the uh, 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 integrated uh, control plane dealing with Kubernetes that it did not, it took like almost one second, two seconds because it was too fast actually. So <laughs> it just went for it. Um, but now it's there, it's, it's already deployed. We are really happy about it. If I want to go back to my uh, terminal here, for example, and I just do um, something like um, get pods and food mag app, I can see that uh, my pods are running inside. It's kind of useless at the moment because uh, the way we deploy things doesn't really allow us to have access to the application. Also, maybe it's it's worth noticing because we're there to discuss about storage OS too, but um, I'm just gonna show you. This is our uh, volume. So our volumes are currently uh, deployed there and they are providing cons uh, uh, persistent storage. If I want to do something a bit interesting too, that would be, and, and by the way, this is the, the readme of the, the repo where you can redo everything if you wish to. Uh, because we have a self-evaluation uh, uh, version that allows you to run this by yourself, and there's a free tier that allows you to have five node cluster with um, five terabyte. It's free forever. So just use it. It's fantastic. And here you can see from uh, a storage OS perspective uh, that we have a couple of uh, two PVC, uh, two PV, uh, two PVC, sorry, 10 gig each. Uh, they are currently on uh, the nodes here with a replica. If I go back to my actual um, window here and my, oh, here we go. Uh, here is storage OS UI I can connect here and I can have a look quickly at the nodes and so on. And because the way we're working, it would be really easy to say, oh, I need to scale up a bit. So let me add, a node, not that one, uh, resize, and I'm gonna put five node. Remember, I'm using the free tier, by the way. I can show you this. So basically, uh, DigitalOcean will provision a new node. It will have appear in, in my list here to show you a bit the, the design. It's the UI that allows you to get back uh, some diagnostic. It, um, you can see the licensing uh, part here. For example, I'm using the developer one. You have all the information about the cluster. If you want to upgrade, uh, here's the different tiers that we have. And then you can have also a view on the namespace available and the volumes. And volumes are by namespace, obviously. So we can go there and have a look at our volume. Let's say this one. And this allows us to see that our master is currently running, master node is currently running on that specific node uh, master volume, sorry, is uh, currently uh, running on that uh, particular node. And we have a replica, which is on this specific node. So if we were to uh, have an issue in the, in the specific node, uh, it will just uh, uh, pick up there and a new replica will be created. So now um, I want to have access to my outside world, okay? So if I come back here and I refresh the, the page, we have a new badge that says that our current deployment is healthy and synced. That's perfect. 
But someone, someone said at some point, I have the ability here with a, a TLS uh, 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 termination to uh, access the outside world. So let me do uh, a bit of a, so this basically, when it comes to a real environment, it means that uh, when a developer wants to change something on the de uh, de uh, deployment, you can peer review what's happening here. And basically at some point you can, if everybody agrees and you do the testing and so on and everything is, is working perfectly, then you can just merge and confirm it. And any changes will basically become available within the main uh, code. So here, if I go there now, I can see that, sorry, I can't click. I have a new file, which is the ingress. The ingress allows you to have access to the outside world here. So meaning that I have a specific URL and I'm asking to have a secure uh, by design uh, the deployment, which means that I have TLS. Um, if I go back here and I refresh, you will see that the versioning changed here. And what is fantastic from a release management perspective, but also from an operational perspective, is that it, it will highlight where you are on the deployment. Think about how difficult it, it is sometimes to understand what is happening uh, in your environment when something changed. And here we can see that the ingress, uh, um, the, the change is about the ingress, it just uh, appear here, and it's orange because it's out of sync. Everything else is there, it's working perfectly. So what you can say is that I can just sync the difference. Uh, so whatever it has been, uh, out of sync with the component, you can just resync that. Okay, so it's currently um, doing the deployment there and we're happy about it. If I go here, I can say, do I have something there? Yeah, I have something there now. So let's see. And I know that some people um, are really past the lover. So I'm just gonna do one thing here. It's to deploy the full thing, just to show you that it's persistent uh, and we're not making any uh, false claim um, about it. So obviously a bit of uh, help. So why it's now it's deploying. Um, uh, there's one thing that we look into. It's basically what it means to be uh, persistent. And to do that, it's it's a question of, about being able to destroy things. So if I do a get pod um, about, and we did it here, or uh, even more, I can look into all the available elements. I can say, for example, the stateful set is the application itself. So obviously I'm not gonna shoot it now, but uh, we'll shoot it at some point. Um, maybe Paul, during the deployment here, you could uh, tell us why we want a stateful set and not a, a typical deployment. I'm just throwing you under the bus. We, yeah. Hello there, Ron. Could you repeat that just to make sure I heard? Yeah, I was just uh, doing the, the wait for this to happen. I was just uh, asking, can you tell, uh, explain the audience why we want a stateful set uh, a de a deployment and not just a deployment? What is the, the advantage of this from a, a Kubernetes standpoint? I'm, I'm, I'm glad you asked that. That was one of the, one of the questions that our, uh, that our audience had, had submitted. Um, so yeah, in short, guys, it's, it's very, very important that when we run stateful workloads within Kubernetes, that we make sure that we run them using the stateful set controller rather than as simple deployments. Um, and there are a couple of reasons for this, but in short, the stateful set has been designed specifically with stateful workloads in mind. So with stateful sets, we get the ability to template our volumes to ensure that we get some unique sequencing um, in startup. And in particular, the stateful set controller gives us some very, very good locking uh, around making sure that volumes are unmounted correctly before we fail uh, pods over to different nodes. So it's really designed to work well with stateful applications and ensure that the data is safe. By contrast, if we consider the way deployment works, um, deployments try to converge to a successful state by spinning up replacement pods before they tear down the old pods, because of course, what they're trying to do is to maximize the amount of uptime for an application. Um, and this can be um, at best confusing um, and, and at worst catastrophic for data applications um, if we're trying to sort of mount 
uh, from a from a, a volume from a from a new pod at, at the same time as it's potentially mounted from an old pod. So this is one of the number one customer inquiries that we see. It's really really important that we use uh, that we use stateful sets rather than deployments. And I will note that this isn't generally understood within the within the industry yet. So. You can find lots and lots of Helm charts out there, for example, uh, lots and lots of prior art on the internet that demonstrates using uh, deployments for stateful workloads. So please don't do that. I'm going to ask you for another contribution, uh, Paul. Um, so uh, during the example here, I deployed a new node uh, on my digital ocean Kubernetes cluster. And as we can see, so basically, um, the new node here, which is three, three four minutes old, uh, is automatically appearing in the cluster, uh, the storage OS cluster. Could you uh, explain uh, how, how, how is it working? From a Absolutely. Daemon set? Yeah. Absolutely. So the way storage OS deploys is with a daemon set. This is the Kubernetes controller, the Kubernetes constructs, which allows us to declare that we'd like one container to be running on every node within the cluster. Um, so it's very simple. When the daemon set is created, that, that, that insists that we run one container on all nodes. So when we introduce a new node into the cluster, Kubernetes simply sees that that daemon set requires an additional member, an additional pod, and it spins up a copy of the storage OS uh, container with the appropriate configuration, such as the target etcd and so on and so forth. What that container will do when it first starts up is realize that it's, that it's new and it, it will join the cluster. So it's all automatic, all easy. And this gives us a great way to sort of horizontally scale our cluster and horizontally scale our, our stateful storage array. This is very hard to do with a traditional system. Um, you know, you, you, you can see that traditional array in the corner. If you want to make it bigger, well, what are, what are your options? They, they, they may be limited, but with a software defined storage array uh, and with storage OS, we can simply add additional nodes to buy ourselves more, 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 more capacity, more space, but also more throughput uh, and distribute load amongst the cluster. Okay. So um, let's have a look here. So basically now our application is, is available uh, and I, 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 I can tell you guys, uh, if you're in the audience, you can have access to it, it's there. So no, no issue there, there's nothing to hide. Uh, I'm just gonna take uh, a moment here. And so uh, as, as we were looking into uh, the uh, different elements here, I have my stateful set. So, Let's say, let's imagine that I'm just going to uh, destroy, for example, uh, the pod uh, for the, the front end. Um, let's see. So if I do, So basically, what happened here is that uh, I'm I'm killing I'm I'm really killing the uh, uh, the part where C the CMS is running. So if I just go back to the page here and I try to refresh, obviously the service is not available anymore. However, if we look at the actual volumes uh, uh, from a storage OS perspective, nothing happened. It just said that it's detached because. The part just died. It's it's um, someone with bad intention just deleted it or doesn't understand what's happening. If we look at Argo here and we do a refresh, we'll see that there's a, a also a mention that it's not there anymore. It just disappeared. Uh, however, because we we're using a, sta a stateful um, deployment, a stateful cell deployment, if I redo this, the actual front end just uh, is just uh, initiating again. And that's because we're using that specific uh, uh, state tool set where we define that we want the desired state to uh, remain on the cluster. So if we delete that part, that's okay. It's just gonna recreate itself. And uh, now it's running. If I go back into my application and do a refresh, it's still, it's still alive, it's back. And I can do it from a database standpoint also, I can kill the, the overall thing. Another element that we could imagine to do, and I think it's really important, despite the fact that we have um, the stateful set that defined the overall uh, uh, deployment for that particular uh, application, if I delete it, this here, what do you think it will happen? So I don't have it anymore. 
my DB is gonna terminate, obviously. But one thing which is really interesting is that from a PVC standpoint, the volume will be still there. At some point it will be, it will not be deleted, okay? So here I don't have it anymore. If I want to, and, and that, that could be a, a serious scenario where for some reason and there's a mistake and you could just come back here, you see that that part is not there anymore, but the, the PV, the volume is still there. So you could just say, okay, something happened and I don't know what happened, or maybe you're uh, changing, uh, uh, you are refactoring your application and you want to change some stuff and you, you will come up with a totally different uh, uh, stateful set definition. But here we have the same, so I'm just gonna redeploy it. Obviously, this is not working anymore. It's gonna hang forever. But the beauty of it is that the data is persistent and it's there because we have a cloud native storage that allows it and that understand how Kubernetes is working. So each time you have a failure or an issue like this, you don't lose your data, it's there. So now I just, look, it's back online, it's there, it's available. Here we go. Um, if the audience have some questions, I will be happy to go through them. Thank you very much, Ron, for an informational and entertaining webinar. You're welcome. So we, uh, we do have uh, a couple of questions. So first question from, from Carolyn. How can we consider backups when running databases like Postgres and Kubernetes? Oh, that's a perfect uh, question. Um, so backup is something that is consistent with any different uh, workload. So uh, whenever you are looking into a, a, a cloud native or not, so um, you, always, you always need to look at consistency. If you take, for example, uh, um, from a Kubernetes standpoint, Valero, or uh, I would say um, uh, Kasten, you could uh, do some, some, some good backup uh, jobs out of the, this product. And um, it's all about the same thing. You will need from a database perspective to be able to freeze the database and make sure that uh, you will have the um, uh, um, uh, IO um, blocked at the database level to, uh, to, to make that, that, that backup. If you don't have that, you will have an inconsistent backup and when you will recover it, that's gonna be uh, kind of an interesting challenge there. It's gonna be part of DB uh, as a service uh, phase two. I'm, I'm writing that right now. So there will be definitely a follow-up on this. That sounds good. And I think it's also worth bearing in mind, guys, that um, all of these databases have APIs which will allow us to, yes. to dump the data directly. So, so lots of good tools out there but let's let's also not not forget the sort of the classics pg dump and so on and so forth uh, they can they can really really help us yeah and I, i'm just going to say that if you if you take for example we're, we're speaking a lot uh, uh, the, the one of the buzz award is the word is uh, multi-cloud and if you go with a solution like gaston or, or valero you will be able to basically uh, capture the state of your uh, current uh, running uh, 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 application, stateful application, and we deploy it somewhere else. So if you think about it, um, it's it's a matter of a couple of seconds to do it. You will take the backup. You can include the backup a job into Argo CD, for example, with a schedule. And if you want to redeploy somewhere else, for example, if you have a failure, then you can have that restore job being available there and target a different cluster to deploy your workload on this new uh, uh, cluster somewhere else. Here we were in the D digital ocean, but you could target an AKS on Azure, for example. Indeed so. Thank you very much. Well, we do have a couple more questions, but um, we're running just short on time here, guys. So we've taken note of your questions and your email addresses, and we will get back to you offline. So thank you very much for your, for, for your attendance. Um, with that in mind, before we wrap up, we should quickly announce the winners of our, um, of our, of our prize draw. So just to say that uh, Joseph Williams, Kevin Kingsbury and Eric Dubois, thank you very, very much. You are the three winners of our prize draw today and uh, we've got your details and your, your gift vouchers will be on their way to you shortly.
Brilliant. Thank I'd you. just like to thank everybody for attending. Thank you, Ron, for presenting. You're welcome. That's my pleasure.